Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 14. Hear the word of God. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet like one of the prophets from long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herod Dias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herod Dias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled. He liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and the dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, up to one half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on platter. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went and beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Well, we thank you for these stories, uh, one from the Old Testament, the prophet Amos, and his uh, preaching to the Israelites in a, in a very dark time in their history. And we thank you for the prophet uh, John the Baptist and his preaching, bold preaching to King Herod. We ask now, Lord, that you would give us understanding of these stories. Help us to un understand the truths and the principles held within these stories so that we can be encouraged and uplifted and emboldened, Lord, to be like these prophets, to speak the truth. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that when you looked at the title of this sermon, Plum Bob Square Stance, you thought, what in the world kind of title is that? For, for so it sounds like one of those goofy cartoon characters on the kids' network. I must admit there is a character called uh, SpongeBob SquarePants on the Nickelodeon network that inspired the title, but that is the extent of SpongeBob's influence on, on this sermon. The basis of this sermon is a bit of ancient construction technology known as the plumb ball. The prophet Amos had a vision of God standing next to a wall holding a plumb bob in his hand. Now what is a plumb bob? A plumb bob is a piece of lead that is in the shape of an inverted raindrop with a string called a plumb line that is attached to the center of the top of the plumb bob. A stonemason or a builder utilizing the force of gravity can take a plumb bob set it next to the wall he just built to see if it is plumb and true and square. When I was a kid, my dad would lay brick and lay block. He would, he would build things at home, carports, different things like that. And I was sitting there and watching him sometimes. 
And, and I remember whenever he was using that plumb bob, after he, after he built a column or a wall, and he, he, he set it up to that plumb bob, he would always say, plumb and square, Joe. Plumb and square. Whenever you, whenever you build anything, you've got to make sure that it is plumb and square. If you get it plumb and square, it's going to be solid, it's going to be stable, it's going to be safe. The wall will be able to hold a lot of weight. He said if the wall isn't plumb, if it's not square, if it's crooked, then it's unsightly and it's even potentially dangerous. I remember, I remember him telling me those things. In Amos' vision, God called him over to this wall and he held this plumb line up at this wall and he said, look at this wall, Amos. It's plumb and square. It is a well-built wall. He said, now I'm going to take this plumb line and I am going to place it among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed. The sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of King Jeroboam. When God held his plumb line up to Israel and their king, Jeroboam, Amos could see the crookedness. He could see the imperfections, the, the unsightly craftsmanship, the poor construction. God's assignment to Amos was to go to the people of Israel and inform them that they have forgotten their center. They have forgotten who the true builder is because they have shifted and made King Jeroboam their center. Their spiritual walls are now out of alignment. They have become crooked. Their great need was to tear down these corrupted walls and rebuild their lives on the solid rock of their faith in God, making sure the walls are straight and plumb and true. Now this was an incredibly difficult message for the Israelites to hear, especially when the economy was good and things seemed to be going well. King Jeroboam's reign had been long and prosperous. But what appears on the surface often masks a catastrophe that was about to occur. And that catastrophe that was about to, to occur was the result of the neglect of the spiritual lives of the people in Israel. The nation was about to be invaded by the superpower Assyria. When it happened, the walls were going to come tumbling down. Now, ironically, People aren't willing to listen to a prophet who is speaking the true word of God until they get into a dire circumstance. That's our human nature. Sometimes it's not until we hit rock bottom that, that we be, begin to listen. As human beings, we tend to block out warnings that our spiritual walls aren't sound, that if we keep going in the wrong direction, they're going to fall down us. It's our tendency not to listen to God until we're in tough trouble. When Amos brought this message to Amaziah, who was Israel's priest, he basically told Amos to get lost. He accused Amos of being a conspirator against King Jeroboam, that he was bent on the king's death and on Israel's destruction. Amaziah's problem was that he was partial to politics rather than to truth and to the power of God. Did you ever meet anyone who was very, very partial to, to a political stand that, that uh, they, they took? Often people who are very partial to, to a certain political stand won't listen to truth, won't listen to the evidence, won't see the plumb line in front of them because they are making their stand on this political policy. Well, this is how Amaziah was. He was committed to King Jeroboam. He was committed to his, his administration, and he wouldn't even listen to truth when it slapped him right in the face. Instead, he told Amos to get lost and sent him on his way. 
Now, John the Baptist in the New Testament faced very similar circumstances. King Herod had this strange fascination with John. The scriptures tell us in Mark 6 that, that Herod feared John the Baptist and he also protected him. Herod believed that the Baptist was a righteous and holy man and he liked to listen to John preach and he often felt puzzled about John's teachings. I'm guessing that King Herod had a conviction in his heart upon hearing John's teaching that, that he needed to change his ways. Of course, John the Baptist, like Amos, preached that same message, plumb and square, plumb and square, how important it is to center our lives on God and align our lives with the teachings of, of God's Word and make our decisions based on the guidance of, of God's Spirit. You see, John the Baptist was a plumb bob, square stance kind of God. To build your life right, you need to humble yourself and get on that firm foundation of the Lord and, and then learn what's right and true. Learn what's good. Learn what is honest and fair. Those are the walls that you build in your life. I'm sure that John the Baptist, as, as he taught, he could see his influence on King Herod. Perhaps he saw him out in the crowd listening to him, and he saw that puzzled facial expression. Perhaps he even spoke personally to Herod. When, when politicians are open to doing the right thing, when they become concerned with actually doing God's will instead of following some political agenda, politicians can do a lot of good when they become concerned with, with doing what's wrong. So John the Baptist's main concern with King Herod was, of course, as we read in the scripture, he was cohabitating with his brother's wife, Herodias, and of course the, the scriptures taught uh, against that, uh, that he was actually cheating on, on his brother. He was deceiving and defrauding his brother in this relationship. And of course John was concerned about that because what happens in a, in a leader's personal life gets carried into their public life. If King Herod was willing to cheat and defraud in this relationship to get what he wanted, then when he got out in the public life and he led the people as a politician, he would cheat and defraud as a politician to get what he wanted. And, and so that was John's concern and as he preached to King Herod. Square and true. Square and plumb. This was the way. John preached to Herod, stop cheating, stop defrauding, get your life straight, be set upon the rock solid foundation of God, be, be a changed person. And so this message was starting to get to King Herod. He was starting to think about it. The scriptures say he even protected John the Baptist as he was thinking about these things. Unfortunately, we know what happened. Instead of listening to the conviction of his heart, Herod focused on the pressure of Herodias and the peer pressure of those who were entertained by the dancing of Herodias' daughter, like the priest Amaziah of Amos' day. Herodias wanted the prophet silenced, and she got her wish. Herod folded, and he had John beheaded. Now there are two important lessons to be learned here from these stories from the Old and the New Testament. The first is this. It is important, incredibly important, as followers of Christ, that we build our lives on that firm foundation, that solid rock of God, and that we build our lives plumb and square, and by that, we learn to be honest. We learn to be fair in all our dealings. We learn to care about our relationships and be committed in our relationships. As a high school teacher, for many, many, many years, 
I, I would give several art tests during the year. And I knew from hearing other teachers talk that kids cheated constantly. They constantly cheated. In fact, if you took a survey of the kids, is cheating all right? Oh, yeah, if you don't get caught, it's all right. It helps you get ahead. Well, see, that's wrong. And, and whenever I give, give, give a test in art, I would say, I hate cheating. I, I said, if you cheat here, you are going to cheat when you get out of life. You're going to cheat people. You're going to deceive people. You're going to defraud people. It starts here. See, this is what we need to teach our kids. This is what we need to, keep, to teach our grandkids. And, and that was John's message. In our relationship with God, we build on that solid, solid, firm foundation. And we teach our kids to be honest. And we teach our kids to be fair and just. We teach our kids to be committed in their relationships. Because it starts right there in the home. And, and if we don't teach those things in the home, then our homes are going to become broken. And when our homes become broken, then society becomes broken. You see, it becomes a, a, a vicious cycle. And so it's very important, that lesson, that we, we need to be committed to that firm foundation, to that honest and, and true way of life. And the second thing is, like Amos and John the Baptist, we need to preach this to the people around us. We need to let our politicians know. We need to let the people at work know. We need to let our, our kids and our grandkids know this is an important way to live because if we don't solve the problem here, it is going to get bigger in, in society. Sometimes I wonder if we've already reached the point of critical mass. Is it too late to save our families? Is it too late to keep the walls of society from falling down? I don't know how many years ago, eight years ago, our uh, financial strength in this country was shattered because of all the cheating that was going on among these investors and these bankers. You wonder, wow, is it too late to, to keep things from coming down upon us? But then I remember Amos, and I remember John the Baptist. It's not our responsibility to make that determination if it's too late or not. God knows what's going on. He knows what's coming our way. It is our responsibility to teach our children and grandchildren what is right and wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is true and what is corrupt. That's our responsibility, and that's what we got to take on. May God give us the courage of Amos and John the Baptist to do so. Amen. Let's turn to our final hymn.